What did you feel when hearing that? Was it nostalgia, maybe, or something deeper? Did it take you back to the streets of New Mombasa, hearing the distant crackle of burning buildings and unearthly voices shouting orders at their subordinates getting closer? Maybe you feel a small glimmer of hope, like there is some light at the end of this dark tunnel, that maybe you won't be alone for much longer. Or maybe it reminds you of looking out a window on a rainy day, the music being the perfect accompaniment as you stop and think. Halo's music definitely has a way of doing that. Whatever that track means to you, I think we can all agree that ODST's music did not have to go as hard as it did. Hello there guys, gals, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leigh Paladin and we finally, we finally got it out. Welcome to part two of why we love the music of Halo. Like the name suggests, if you haven't seen the first one, take your time to give it a watch. Links will be uh, somewhere on the screen. But for those of you who have been waiting, hopefully this is worth it. So what do you think of when I mention Halo's music? If there's one type of sound that you could argue Halo is best known for, it's probably choir. Choir is Halo's defining sound. It's one of those things that people instantly associate with the series. It's by no means something that's exclusive to Halo, but how it's used is so different to any other video game soundtrack that I can think of. I mentioned in part one how the Gregorian monk chant and choir throughout the Halo series was representative of the Forerunners and the legacy that they've left behind, frequently being heard when we're first encountering one of their ancient, epic, and mysterious installations, or uncovering something new about these enigmatic beings. Throughout Halo's history, we start to untangle the intricate web of hints that were dropped since combat evolved. As humans, we are reclaimers of the Forerunner's technology. For some reason, in their infinite wisdom, they decided to leave it all to us. It's fitting then that this revelation is teased to us right from the word go, as when we're introduced to the Master Chief in Cryo, what do we hear? Cracking the case in 30 seconds. He's hot, blowing the pins in five. the same Gregorian monk chant that makes up the theme for Halo and by extension, the Forerunners. This little cue is instilling this idea in our heads of a connection between Chief and the Forerunners, or humanity and the Forerunners. Choir is the perfect musical representation of humanity, as after all, it is the human voice. But it's also used to represent the Forerunners, maybe teasing that somehow there is perhaps a shared lineage. Maybe we even are forerunners, hmm? Maybe, maybe that was the case before someone retconned it. <clears throat> but it's not the only time we hear choir or some form of vocalization in Halo though. It runs throughout the soundtrack in many, many different forms. New choir motifs and themes can be heard for other forerunner installations, a musical idea that started with Delta Halo in Halo 2. That is another Halo. Say what? It's a strange kind of inverse of the theme for Alpha Halo from CE. Speaking of Alpha Halo, we hear that Alpha Halo theme used again during the reveal of a replacement ring for it in Halo 3. The Ark gets its own choir motif too.
Brute ships. Staggered line. Shipmaster. They outnumber us three to one. Then it is an even fight. Burn their mongrel hides. And Zeta Halo gets its own theme as well that starts off with the Alpha Halo theme reminding us of that same sort of joy and exploration that we experienced from the first Halo ring that we landed on, but then transitions into its own new theme. One that I think encapsulates the beauty and mystery of Zeta Halo and its very complex past. Halo's choir also tends to mix authentic recorded vocals with synthetic ones. Originally done by Marty O'Donnell to flesh out the sound of the choir used in CE's soundtrack and make it sound grander than it actually was, as they only had five vocalists, the mix of artificial and real vocalizing became a quintessential part of Halo's musical identity. It gives this artificial and otherworldly quality to the vocals that I think reflects the series as a whole, especially the Halos themselves. Again, the human voice representing humanity and this strange, not quite human voice that is synthetic playing alongside it to represent the Forerunners. Or in the case of the Halos themselves, they're so close to being something recognizable to us, especially the environments. They're so close to being like something we could see on Earth, something natural. But then there's this unknown an artificial element to it that jumbles up your brain, represented by the use of organic human voices combined with something synthetic. In fact, almost every faction or species that has some kind of connection to the Forerunners has their own choral arrangement. If the Forerunners could be represented by the Gregorian monks and ethereal, echoey, and sometimes unearthly sounding choir, what about, say, the Flood, for example? The Flood are first introduced to us with this piece, Devil's Monsters. The pounding percussion and discordant rising string stings, that could be a metal band name, discordant rising string stings, someone should make that up, immediately tell us that we're in danger. It gets your heart pounding as you realize that what you've walked into is not going to be as easy as the Covenant which you've dealt with up until this point. Devil's Monsters is, in comparison, far less terrifying than the themes that would come to represent the Flood later, however. Over the course of the Halo games, their theme evolves and changes, much like they do. When we first see the Flood, they're uncoordinated, they're feral and animalistic and simple space zombies. There is no higher level of communication or intelligence there yet. No hive mind as such. Later in Combat Evolved, the Flood are also accompanied by this piece, called Shadows. The pulsing percussion still remains, but this time the strings are piercingly high. We first hear a bit of Shadows when activating the Forerunner Light Bridge in the second mission of Combat Evolved, subtly implying that there is something darker about this ring that we're not sure about yet, that we're getting closer to the deeper down we go and the more we uncover about this ring. It's also used in the final cutscene of Assault on the Control Room, when we're first teased to the Flood's existence when Cortana starts freaking out about Captain Keys going to inspect a supposed Covenant weapons cache. You're a ship's captain, you are a very valuable target. Maybe don't get involved in military operations, maybe hang back, you know? By the time Halo 2 rolls around, we hear Shadows, now part of the Mausoleum Suite. This time though, the vocals are far more prominent and creepy sounding. Halo 2 is also when we're introduced to the Flood's central intelligence, the Gravemind. It's heard again throughout Halo 3, most notably in the track called Gravemind, though this time it's paired with some very creepy and almost demonic sounding reversed and pitched down voices. Much like how the Flood started as feral and uncoordinated in CE, as they evolve and the Gravemind comes into the picture, acting as a connecting voice for the Flood, their theme starts to represent this with the vocals, becoming more demonic and terrifying much like the Flood, who now also have the ability to talk in Halo 3, echoing the Gravemind's voice and thoughts. The vocals in the Flood's theme are like 
The many countless voices of those who have succumbed to this parasite, their intelligence, their knowledge, their voice, and everything they were becoming part of this cacophony of distorted screams and anguish. A timeless chorus. The more people that join it, the more intelligent and ruthless the Flood gets, the scarier their theme does too. The different elements of the Flood's theme have all stacked on top of each other like it's growing, evolving. The pulsing percussion from Devil's Monsters, the high strings from Shadows, the discordant vocals from the Mausoleum Suite, and now the reversed talking from Gravemind. Now, the Flood aren't the only species with a grudge against the Forerunners. In Halo Infinite, we're introduced to a new species of alien called the Zalanin, otherwise known as the Endless. Sealed away in Silexes, vaults employed by the Forerunners to preserve life, but in this case, used as temporal prisons. While we don't know much about their origins or what they're capable of exactly, we know that there's a long-running rivalry between them and the Forerunners. The Endless have their own choral suite in Infinite Soundtrack, aptly called Endless. This vocalizing is different to the soothing tenor of the Forerunner's Gregorian monk chant, and not nearly as frightening as the Flood's reversed and dissonant vocals. These vocals sound angry, and in some ways tragic. These voices have a lot of reverb applied on them, giving the impression that they're screaming out into the void, wanting to be heard, but are locked away somewhere deep. Gareth Coker, one of a few composers who worked on Halo Infinite soundtrack, blew it out of the park with this one. In the final act of the game, when Chief and the Weapon have to face the Harbinger, the first of the Endless to be awoken, we hear the Endless chant, but it's frequently interrupted by the Gregorian monks and the staple Halo percussion and staccato strings, representing Master Chief. It's like a clash of two differing sounds, the two champions of these factions fighting physically as well as musically. The ancient, epic and mysterious choir that Marty came up with to represent the Forerunners and their legacy has now been riffed on to serve as inspiration for other ancient and mysterious races in Halo's galaxy. Similarly, choir and vocals in the Halo soundtracks can be used to represent other things too, aside from just factions and races within the universe. Marty frequently uses a type of music that he calls GLUE, which I have turned into an acronym to mean, good lord, it's ultrasonic excellence. Yeah, look, it might need a bit of work. I'll let the man himself explain what it means. So I have lots of different kinds of pieces of music. I have pieces that I call GLUE that are just kind of... Uh, ambient, uh, smushy sounding pieces uh, like this. And then if I hit play on this next piece, it would correspond to a stinger, a little shaker sound. Then we can trigger our percussive piece. And then in the percussive piece, I can say, play an alt version, which means it's gonna start to get a little bit more active. I'm going to hit stop, and we'll come to a nice natural out. The TLDR, glue music is used between the main, more melodic tracks, frequently playing during moments of downtime when you're not in combat, just taking in the views and enjoying the sights and scenes of Halo before transitioning. <coughs> <coughs> Fucking hell, <coughs> I got a flood spore stuck in my throat before transitioning into another piece. These ethereal glue tracks play a pivotal part in establishing the mysterious atmosphere that Halo is known for. These echoed incorporeal voices feel as though they're floating down the Forerunner corridors that we're trekking in, or traveling through the air around us. They feel like they're part of the game's sound effects and atmosphere, not just the music. 
In Reach, however, the glue tracks are haunting compared to the original trilogy's use of glue music, which was frequently eerie and otherworldly, partly due to the use of synth pads and strings and choir, and had occasional moments of hope with the interjection of major chords, Reach's glue music sends chills down your spine and makes everything feel dire, perfectly matching the sombre tone of Reach's story and the hopelessness of the situation that Noble Team find themselves in. Or of the planet Reach itself. We become attached to the planet throughout the game and it's made out to be more than just a rock floating in space. It's referred to like a person sometimes. And now with its surface being desecrated and burnt to hot glass, the vocals feel like the planet and its people are screaming out in pain. The disembodied voices of many who are gone now because of the Covenant's ruthless invasion. Without the Forerunner's enigmatic legacy hanging over the story, no halo rings and <clears throat> no f***ing voice either because I keep coughing, <coughs> oh god. No halo rings and no Master Chief, well, sort of, he's just sitting there napping out back. It fell to Marty and Michael to create a brand new sound for Bungie's final Halo game. Reach manages to maintain a similar feeling to the soundtrack of the original trilogy and occasionally references old motifs, but is predominantly brand new music. If Reach's soundtrack could be summed up, I'd say that it's all about giving you a little glimmer of hope but taking it away just as quickly. We start with some classic military bangers with the likes of Winter Contingency, or pieces with upbeat percussion that play off the original Halo theme and the feelings and hope that instills in us, like Tip of the Spear. And then suddenly, so much of that hope is gone. After the final cutscene of Tip of the Spear and Long Night of Solace, where the tide of the battle for Reach completely changes, the music takes a noticeably more sombre tone going forward. Exodus starts by paying homage to In Amber Clad. A piece of music that plays during a similarly hopeless situation from Halo 2's campaign. God damn! Jackal snipers! All the death scenes from Halo Reach combined could not equate to the pain I felt trying to get through that damn waterfall segment on Delta Halo. I kid of course. What I think these allusions to music from the original trilogy are doing is trying to elicit some positive emotions, reminding us that there is hope somewhere on the horizon, that what we're doing isn't entirely for nothing. It's paying on that emotional equity that Marty talks about. Throughout Reach's soundtrack, we get a new motif, as the use of the Halo Gregorian monk chant wouldn't exactly be fitting for a game taking place on something that isn't a Halo. Instead, there's a new tritone motif that's just two chords getting developed upon throughout the game. It's really simple. F minor, B major, that's it. These two chords are found literally everywhere in Reach's soundtrack, but they're used in very different ways each time. Marty uses those chords as the backing for different melodies that play over the top, and it's played by brass and horns, strings, piano, choir, similarly to the Halo theme from the original trilogy and how it can be orchestrated in different ways to reflect the mood of a scene. When we first hear this motif in Reach's opening cutscene, it's enthusiastic, backed by a similar sort of percussive beat to the Halo theme, played in its full glory. It also escalates, the notes getting higher and higher, which provides a feeling of heroic optimism. When we're seeing Reach bombed by the Covenant from orbit and during George's final goodbye, it's far sadder stripping back the amount of instruments used to just the high strings, a harp and choir. Tell him to make it count. When Cat gets taken out, we hear it played on a piano, though it no longer transitions into the escalating hopeful theme of Winter Contingency, we get a completely new piece at the end of the new Alexandria suite called Ashes, that helps to strike home the severity of the situation and how hopeless everything now feels. The full brass and choir orchestration, first heard early in the game, slowly becomes more melancholic until by the time we get to Lone Wolves, the motif is played again, but this time, it's just a lone piano. With all the members of Noble Team gone, it seems fitting that the Lone Wolf is the last one left, accompanied by a lone piano 
with all the other instruments and his team members now gone as well. Though if we really want to talk about loneliness, I think it's worth bringing up Halo 3 ODST. Marty O'Donnell was once again given a broad description for the soundtrack, just like Combat Evolved, by Joseph Staten, who was the creative lead for ODST. Instead of ancient, epic, and mysterious, the inspirations were to be the soundtracks of film noir that had been popular during the 1940s. Typically characterised by their high contrast, monochrome cinematography, cynical protagonists, their whodunit storylines, and of course, their soundtracks that ooze this feeling of being in a rainy nighttime atmosphere or walking down a dark, smoky alleyway uncovering a mystery. Having been taught at USC Thornton School of Music by David Raxon, who had previously composed soundtracks for noir films such as 1944's Laura and 1955's The Big Combo, Marty must have had some good classroom lessons to call back on when composing the soundtrack for ODST. A lot of people seem to confuse the soundtrack of ODST as falling under the genre of jazz, which I mean, yes, but also no. It's definitely got some small jazz combo influences, most notably the saxophone, which is a common instrument used in many jazz compositions and arrangements. But if anything, I'd say there's a closer relation to the blues. Jazz music is usually livelier and more upbeat. It swings and has unusual time signatures or uses abstract and unpredictable chord movements and borders on experimental at times. It's not for everyone. Blues tends to be far more melancholic and slow. Both have improvisation at their core, but the blues influences to me feel far more prominent than jazz in ODST especially with the use of non-standard chords like 7th and 11th chords and the 6-8 time signature, which is a staple for blues compositions and pops up quite regularly in various tracks within ODST. Which makes sense though, right? ODST is a very bluesy game. You're on your own, it's raining, and it feels like this damned city is out to get you. It's not just the music of film noir that found a place in ODST's soundtrack though. There are also some nods to scores of science fiction films of the 1950s, with a sign synth or theramone sound popularised by classics like The Day the Earth Stood Still. The use of these types of whining synths expresses an otherworldliness that no other instrument can convey. Even though New Mombasa is supposed to be a familiar human city, there's an alien-like quality to it that's not just represented by the Covenant being there, but this strange, very different type of instrument, cutting through the rest of the soundscape, the strings, the piano, etc. There's something noticeably out of place about its inclusion, in a good way. It's kind of similar to what Marty did previously with the mix of human and synth choir, remember? That juxtaposition of something familiar with the conventional orchestral instruments mixed with this unearthly synthesizer. A similar effect is achieved with the use of what I think is a steel pedal guitar, or some form of electric guitar that's being played with a slide and has a lot of reverb applied to it. This unnatural sliding between the notes creates a feeling of unease and tension. Humans naturally don't like the sound of notes being played too close to each other or something that falls in between the conventional notes that we use in musical theory and hear all the time. It's why an out-of-tune piano sounds so scary and is often used in the scores of horror films. It's not quite right. Sliding up and down the frets of a guitar triggers a similar sort of discomfort within us. It makes us feel on edge and like something isn't right as the notes don't move between each other properly. This can best be heard in Neon Night, where the sliding guitar and sine synth play off each other as they both have a similar kind of modulation. To offset this though, is the use of saxophone and piano. If there was a word I could use to describe these instruments and their use in ODST, it would be warm. These instruments are more familiar to us and they give us a feeling of comfort when we hear them, especially when played within a more positive sounding piece. A lot of ODST's music that plays in the Mombasa Street's hub world is actually quite melancholic and depressing, so when Deference for Darkness and The Light at the End kick in, it's a refreshing bit of optimism that cuts through the gloomy skies overhead. For a while I used to think this piece was called Defense for Darkness, like this track is a shield against all the dark, awful stuff happening around you, but yeah, that that was, uh, that was just me not being able to read apparently. A lesser known fact though is that ODST almost had a very different instrument at its core. We all love the saxophone, but 
it could have been something else. Uh, Joe had played some uh, Miles Davis for me, and it was a little too trumpet, it was a little too uh, jazz. It, it came to me because I didn't want to do muted trumpet like Joe wanted me to do, so... Uh, huh. I, saxophone I said beginning. smoky sax, I was... Well, you see, I, but you don't know what smoky sax actually means. <laughs> I think you probably thought I said smoky sax, and you just didn't... <laughs> During early discussions between Joe and Marty, the music of Miles Davis and his style of muted trumpet playing from albums like Kind of Blue were considered. Instead of saxophone, we might have gotten muted trumpet playing those solo pieces. Muted trumpet is another staple of film noir soundtracks and is basically achieved by sticking a big old metal plug in the front of the trumpet. I'm just going to hop on over to the timeline where that happened and give you an example of what Deference for Darkness might have sounded like if Joe had gotten his wish of a muted trumpet instead of saxophone. So Joe, if you're watching this, I hope you enjoy. As for the rest of you, just relax, take it in, all the sights and scenes as we listen to what might have been. If you play Halo Reach's third to last mission, The Package, on Legendary, and manage to survive the onslaught of Covenant forces, there's actually a great easter egg you can access by pressing a button on the outside of the map. Doing so will allow you to enter Dr. Halsey's lab early, where you'll find something very special indeed. Marty's final love letter to the Halo series is from the vault. Not only are you literally finding a vault of treasures when this track plays in game, but Marty is also pulling some tracks from his vault of music for this particular piece. Starting with that percussive role that a few tracks in Reach are known for, it transitions into Farthest Outpost from Halo 3, what I consider to be the theme for the arc, and a place of great importance in that game. Then we get in Pend and Prologue, both of which were first introduced and frequently heard in Halo 2, the latter of which especially is significant as it's essentially the theme for the Covenant. The Moor, which brings us back to Combat Evolved, and finally loops around to a short piece called Small Victory that can be found on the soundtrack towards the middle of the Behold a Pale Horse Suite. Just about every Halo game and their soundtrack gets a bit of love in this piece, and they all transition flawlessly into each other. In Dr. Halsey's lab where this track plays, you can find all sorts of Easter eggs tracing back to the very first Halo game, and the music just really seals the deal for me, calling back to all these tracks and really making the most out of that use of emotional equity. Something about the ethereal synths and choir of Small Victory towards the end of the track just chokes me up every time while reading reports on stupid tricks with flying warthogs or the simulation troopers from Red vs. Blue. This easter egg in Halsey's lab feels like a tribute to the first 10 years of Halo, the deep, rich connection that Bungie had with it and its community, and the love that Marty has especially for the music he, Michael, and others composed for the series. One last hurrah that summarises the feeling of Halo and what Marty set out to do from the very beginning after his first chat with Joe Staten. Make something that sounded ancient, epic, and mysterious. And From the Vault is all of those things. So why do we love the music of Halo? Well, it's different things for different people. Like I've hopefully been able to convey throughout these two videos, it represents characters, places, or events. It's about 
when the music and when certain leitmotifs and themes are used. It tells a story all on its own. It reminds us of days gone by where the world felt simpler. It links together narrative ideas and makes us think about the virtual world around us and the craftsmanship that went into making it. Too often in first person shooters we can get fixated on the combat, but Halo, unlike many other games, feels like it's encouraging you to stop and soak up the environment. And the music plays a big part in that, beckoning you to just slow down, listen, and watch. Think about where you're standing and the implications that led to how you got here, whether that's at the edge of the galaxy or back home on Earth. I believe it was Curtis Schweitzer who said in an interview that I can't find now because the Halo Waypoint website is a f***ing mess, that Halo's idea of action music is often far less intense and hyperactive than other video game soundtracks. It can feel calm and serene even during moments of intense pressure, much like the Master Chief. The music can be urgent when it needs to be, but it's also not blasting in your ears constantly. Why we love Halo's music is subjective. It means something different to everyone, and I'm sure one of those reasons that I listed off is probably applicable to you. But for me, I love Halo's music because of how it makes me feel. The range of emotions that it can bring out of me and the memories that flood back, pun intended, is unlike any other video game soundtrack that I've listened to. What other soundtrack can you point to that shoots people right back to their childhoods with one piano note? Or two chords? I don't think you could point to another. I think the music is one of the biggest contributors to why Halo, especially the games made by Bungie, despite their age, have such longevity and have lasted in the public consciousness longer than any other FPS game of a similar age. Everyone has their own opinions on the Halo games. Believe it or not, there are some people who don't like Halo 3. I mean, those people are subhuman, but that's not the point. Each game has its detractors for any number of reasons. Some dislike Halo Combat Evolved's repetitive corridors. Some loathe Halo 2's buggy button combos or Reach's armor abilities and so on. But out of every single person that I've talked to about these games, not one person has said a bad word about Marty and Michael's music or even Neil Davidge and Kazuma Janauchi's in a vacuum on their own when not being compared to what came before. Same goes for the music composed by Gareth Coker, Joel Korolitz, Curtis Schweitzer, and Alex Bohr for Infinite's multiplayer. I challenge you to find someone who could say something bad about Halo's music. You just can't. Even if the Halo games themselves have divided people, whether that be because of the choices made about the gameplay, the sandbox, the story, whatever, it doesn't matter. The music seems to unanimously bring us all together. The music is so incredibly well composed and orchestrated, you can listen to it all on its own without the games, and it's still exceptional. Halo is a divisive series, let's not kid ourselves. If there's one thing I've learned from being a Halo content creator, it's that you can't please everyone. But the music, the music gets pretty damn close. that they're scrambling over each other to get it. Well, I don't care if it's God's own anti-son of a fish machine or a giant hula hoop, we're not gonna let them have it. What we will let them have is a belly full of lead and a pool of their own blood to drown in. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! 